Uh, as you know, the topic of uh, today's event is uh, responding to gendered violence. Uh, we are living now through a period of massive cultural change around violence against women. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the public is now much more aware of uh, this issue and there is a real pressure for uh, the government, for, for the criminal justice system to uh, dedicate more resources to address this issue and so on. However, uh, as we also know, the uh, police and the criminal justice system are still failing women and uh, with the last year being a particularly difficult year with many distressing stories uh, of killings of women in uh, public places and also the shocking revelations about uh, the extent of misogyny in the police force. Uh, we still face many institutional and structural barriers and the patriarchal systems and negative stereotyping around gender. So today we will talk about how can we address gendered violence, its causes and uh, responses. Can we develop better educational and uh, community-based solutions to gendered violence? So these are the issues that our four presenters will address today. We have four uh, excellent speakers today. Uh, each of them will have about 20 minutes uh, to, to present, and then we will have uh, a... Uh, June, uh, perhaps some panel questions and, and, and then uh, I will open the floor uh, for a discussion. So now I'm very pleased to uh, invite Dr. Dr. Angela Phoenix, a senior lecturer in criminology and policing at our university. Uh, Angela's uh, sphere of interest is domestic violence and policing and her research has been funded by the ESRC and the Essex Police. And Angie will present a paper on improving police responses to domestic violence with three question marks. So let me share uh, Angie's file. Okay, Angie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, welcome, good evening, everybody. I've just been having a little look down the list. I see some current students, some previous students, and some newbies that I don't know. So, but welcome to everybody. Um, thank you, Svetlana, for the introduction as well. Um, you probably summed up in a couple of minutes what I'm gonna stretch out over 20. Um, but yeah, I hope that um, it's engaging enough as well. The three question marks as well there are in reference to the idea that police responses to domestic violence might be improving but obviously there's a big question mark over that because there are some consistencies in terms of women's voices about how they receive uh, police responses to domestic violence and also because of the current issues um, that are at play as well we know that there are still significant problems so i'm going to kind of think about some of the developments over time which might be considered progress and then also think about how comes we haven't made more progress given these developments. So the basis of why I'm invited here is because I did my research on policing of domestic violence, PhD research, started in 2014, went on far longer than it should have done because um, personal stuff got in the way. Um, but yeah, it was a PhD project. I was invited to go and have a chat with the Chief of Essex Police, um, more, more who I knew than what I knew, I think, initially. Um, and they were looking to, to improve their responses to domestic violence victims. So they asked me to come up with a plan, which I did. Um, and putting it very briefly, there was kind of two strands to the research, looking at what police do and what victims need. Um, 
due to, to credit to the Chief Constable at the time, Stephen Kavanagh, now been replaced, but Chief Constable at the time he retired, um, he gave me full access. I basically went through police vetting, I had a badge, I was told I could go in, go where I like, do what I like basically, and look at what I like, and, and that it really was the case that anybody that I asked for files and or I had logged into all the systems to be able to access them. In one way that was great, but in another way that just created a huge dilemma about what I would look at and what was most important to look at. As it says at the top there, it's a qualitative analysis. I took a different approach really to researching police in practice than the kind of uh, research projects that were around at the same time as mine. I'm going to get to that a bit more in a little while. But basically, I spent around, over the period of four years, I spent months and months with Essex Police. Over one 18-month period, I spent at least a couple of days a week there. So it became, you know, I really became um, part of the office there, if you like, if not part of the culture, I might add. Um, some of the reasoning behind why I was invited there and some of the reasoning behind why we needed this research in particular in Essex but the problem is across the board, um, was that Essex Police over a number of years, particularly facing scrutiny, criticism for their handling of domestic violence. And in particular, these three cases, when they hit the media, um, caused considerable criticism for Essex Police and their response to domestic violence. All of these victims here um, were in contact with Essex Police prior Apart from the bottom right picture, that's me, by the way, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Maria Stubbins, Christine and Shania Chambers and Jeanette Goodwin. They were all killed um, by current or previous partners. All had been in contact with Essex Police. And I'm, I'm summarising it very quickly. There are IPCC reports um, that you can read regarding these cases, but basically failures in understanding and responding to the levels of risk that was present in these cases um, led or in, contributed to these outcomes. There's no way of knowing if the police had responded differently. Would these women and, and Shania still be alive? Um, there's no way of knowing that, so we can't fully put that on the police's doorstep, but we can uh, certainly highlight the failings um, in terms of their recognition of risk and responding to risk. Um, that's me on the bottom right. When I was still married, I um, experienced domestic violence myself over a 20 year period. That's me uh, helping my daughter with her, with her homework there. Um, wearing the roll neck, the, the standard uniform I used to, used to wear at the time, no hairdos, no makeup. Um, and the standard roll neck, which was my kind of dress, because there was lots of comments about what to wear and what not to wear. But essentially, I put myself there because it, that was one of the reasons also why I was invited to do this research. I was um, doing my undergraduate degree at Essex and got invited um, to go and speak to the chief, as I said, because I did fairly well in, in my degree, I suppose. And there was knowledge that I was also a victim of domestic violence. I was going through divorce and, and all of that while I was doing my undergrad, a little bit stressful. Um, but yeah, so there was knowledge that I had personal background and some academic uh, ability. But also it's key here because I was also responded to by Essex Police, I live in Essex. So over those 20 years as well, I had my own experiences of being responded to by Essex Police. Um, However, I now brought with it something more um, in an academic context, something more of an understanding. I, um, I broke down whilst at uni, I had to leave a lecture on domestic violence um, because it was all almost as if they were talking about me. I don't come from an academic background. There's no um, higher education in my family or anything. And I, I come from a family where feminism was a pretty much a dirty word as well. Um, and there was domestic violence running right through my extended family. So. Actually, I, I didn't have an understanding of my problem um, as being a public problem. I thought it was, you know, an Angie problem, really. Um, but yeah, the academia helped to, to kind of open my mind a bit more and hence me being invited to do the research. So first of all, I want to think about some of the developments. As I said, there's been a huge number of developments in terms of 
understanding and responding to de domestic violence generally, but also these should have had a significant impact on the police, a, a significant positive impact on the policing of domestic violence. You know, it's no surprise to anyone here that the um, women's movement, feminist criminologists, victimologists, etc., huge contribution to our understanding and awareness around domestic violence and to moving forward and, and improving responses to domestic violence since the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and essentially, no, nope, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I got distracted. I'm sitting by the window, sorry. Um, yeah, so hugely responsible and underpinning all of the developments, kind of as I go through these developments, this kind of movement, this energy underpinning it all, really, that you'll find that there are um, feminist activists running through all of the developments that we see in terms of responding to and understanding domestic violence. Many of them survivors themselves, um like myself i kind of just started and picked here to start with the 80s i didn't want to go back too far but also to think about develop significant development so with the british crime survey now crime survey of england and wales during the 80s we all of a sudden had access to a greater uh, level of knowledge and understanding about victimization and in particular women's victimization still doesn't give us the full picture we know it's massively underreported whether we're talking about policing and or victimization surveys but of course it gave us a, a huge range of data to be able to understand these problems as more significant um, in terms of the survey itself, it's been developed and progressed over time. So the self-completion module introduced in 2004 allowed for laptops. So basically victims were able to, rather than have to articulate their experience to an interviewer, they would complete um, modules on a laptop. So again, once they did this, that increased the numbers of victims that were disclosing their experiences of domestic violence. Increasingly, we see improvements around, so you could now, there's a false level data tool that you can use. You can go in and actually see the raw data for each police force if you want to look at that. And also, importantly, uncapped data. It was previously the case that victimizations could be capped at five. However, that's now been uncapped. It still has a range of methodological issues I'm not going to bore you with now, but actually, it's again, it's revealing more about repeat victimization. And in particular, if we're looking at policing performance, repeat victimization is a key kind of statistics for police to, to, um, to investigate as well, because it does, as it says there, have the potential to be an important performance measure. It, it helps to demonstrate where they are dealing with it and not dealing with it effectively. So as well as this, during the 1990s as well, developments, significantly in terms of the abolition of marital immunity in rape cases so husbands no longer immune for, from being charged with rape whether they actually are or not as we know is is another matter um but actually seeing legislative moves to to make changes and again all this pushed forward by um activism around the women's movement etc domestic homicide reviews i'm kind of flipping through these i know that i apologize but i kind of want to get a gist of, of exactly the, the the kind of developments that have taken place that could have led to some improvement um domestic homicide reviews came into force in 2011 but basically they did some before that informed the establishment of the dash which i'm going to get to in a second but basically being able to look at the domestic homicide cases so where they end in the most tragic of outcomes looking at the risk factors etc involved so learning lessons ultimate opportunities to learn lessons um, from tragic circumstances the dash um, the risk assessment tool introduced in 2009 informed by the results of the domestic homicide reviews the common risk factors for officers to look for the 27 questions in the dash allows officers to ask intelligent questions around um, risk factors related to domestic violence, harassment, stalking, honour-based violence, and uh, there is coercion and control in it. Despite the, the date of it there, um, there is the ability to recognise 
coercion and control with the questions that are in there. There is the ability, I say, it doesn't mean that that is what actually happens. Um, we've seen some political will, if you like, and I use the term loosely, in terms of strategies to end violence against women and girls. You see here a broader terminology. Um, this always makes me wonder a little bit because you see these government strategies, you can see various iterations of it there from 2010 up to recently 2021. They talk more broadly about violence against women and girls. It's quite clear about the focus of them. However, if you look like I have in any detail at the policing of domestic violence, you'll find that there is not necessarily this articulation of, of this violence against women and girls. It's not articulated in that way. Um, there's actually some resistance to recognising it in that way. So from the very get go there, there's there's it's the odds the, the policing understanding uh, and the police police will to deal with it is at odds with government strategies which lay down how they will be dealing with it um internationally as well we've had conventions to respond to set kind of standards internationally about how we respond to domestic violence um and this places pressure on countries to up their game if you like in how they respond to domestic violence and in particular the kind of funding and the measures that they put in place to protect and safeguard victims. College of Policing established in 2012, basically a work work centre to look at policing practice, looking very much at evidence based policing and advising on recommend, uh, giving recommendations on how to improve police performance across the board, not just for domestic violence, but there is also domestic violence focus. Importantly as well, Thematic reviews and inspections, um, not just from the HMIC, but the HMIC ones are key. They're kind of what motivates officers I found when I was there at Essex Police. Um, um, at the time I was there, they were being reviewed for vulnerability, um, which was quite a good um, view for me to have of that process. Um, and they really hold quite a lot of weight about the kind of um, judgment that they're gonna get. Um, they got an inadequate, and it was quite significant watching their reaction to that. Um, the defensiveness in some cases, but also the sadness in others, um, that, that despite efforts, they're still not managing um, to achieve a, level, a standard of, of service and response to vulnerable people um, that is acceptable. We've also seen other strategies, domestic violence disclosure scheme, more commonly known uh, to many people as Claire's Law, um, where you can ask, anybody can go along and ask you form, and you can ask about somebody you um, may be involved with, ask about their history and, and their involvement in domestic abuse. Um, for various reasons, again, I'm not gonna go into an evaluation of it itself. In some ways, it, it works, it can give information. It, in my own case, when I did find out that there was a long history of domestic abuse going back to when my husband, ex-husband was, was 18, um, it kind of helped to confirm to me, again, it wasn't an Angie problem, it, it was a much bigger problem. Um, so it can kind of help in that uh, regards to being informed. But in other ways, once you're informed now, you might think, well, okay, so now I know this, but what am I gonna do about it? And what levels of protection are there to go with it? So there are, uh, there are pros and cons to it. Uh, domestic violence protection notices on orders, also introduced here to in 2014. This helps to give some room, some space for victims. It's basically an order which can be put in place up to 28 days and certain um, requirements in there. The chief one being that the perpetrator can't go home, maybe other um, conditions put in there as well regarding staying away from workplaces and schools, etc. cetera. Um, but basically giving space to the victim, but also to agencies to work with victims um to be able to safeguard them effectively in the longer term if that's possible authorized professional practice on domestic abuse we had introduced in 2015 from the college of policing it's a significant document a big long one that basically guides police officers on how they should respond to domestic violence if you was to read it it kind of does address all of the things you'd want it to address um, so it's not like they don't know how to respond to it correctly there is a wealth uh, of information there um, around what they should and could be doing. 
and of course the statutory definition for domestic abuse most recently introduced in 2021 under the Domestic Abuse Act. So some significant developments in terms of the policing of domestic violence, which should mean that we get a better response. Um, also alongside those, there's other things I haven't mentioned there, but which are key to the response to domestic violence. It's not just a policing matter, it's a multi-agency matter. That's well recognised that it isn't just for the police to deal with, we do need others to come in on that. DB champions, one of the recommendations I made to Essex Police a, a few years back. Um, some forces have picked that up, Durham, Surrey, Merseyside. So basically having those champions within the staff that are able, um, that have a better understanding of DB, they have the training around DB and can help and support those that perhaps need it, other staff, other frontline officers that perhaps need support with responding to DB. Multi-agency safeguarding hubs so they'd work alongside education, social services, probation, etc., which also happens at the Marrick meetings, yeah, the risk assessment conferences, mainly dealing with high risk victims and perpetrators to look at what measures can be put in place to protect them. And also IDVAS, independent domestic violence advisors. They, I met those uh, placed at Essex Police as well. Um, some key work that they do in terms of supporting, again, mainly high risk because of the, the lack of resource, but mainly high risk victims, but helping them to go through the process of making statements, of attending court, et cetera, and helping them to access outside services that will help in terms of safeguarding. So a huge amount of measures. As well alongside this, a growing emphasis on what works yeah on evidence-based policing an appetite in policing to engage with academics hence me being invited as well to do my research um and the idea of doing this scientific evaluation of police practice so that then what they do do can be well informed by research evidence um nothing wrong with that in a sense i i was a bit concerned about my research because it didn't fit with it seemed with some of the emphasis that was placed on doing these randomised control trials. Yeah. The, in other words, having a treatment, having a control group and then measuring the success of it based on the certain amount of uh, certain outcomes rather. Um, so I've got some examples. Um, evaluation of DBPOs reporting a reduction. Uh, that's the domestic violence protection orders reporting a reduction in incidents. Another random controlled trial there from CARA, uh, the CARA experiment. So basically looking at where a caution is given to first time um, domestic violence cases, where to first time domestic violence perpetrators. I'd argue that that's shady in itself if we're talking about, if they've come to the police attention for the first time, it's not the first time they've done it. Um, but again, here reporting that there were 35% fewer men reoffended against their partner after receiving this caution. So some positive results to be found for them. Whatever criticisms we may make of them as well, there are some positives to take. Project 360, this one involves engagement workers, so like a call centre if you like, contacting victims within 24 hours of the incident to refer them out to local services. Can also go steps further in terms of helping them with statements and face-to-face -face visits. Here, uh, uh, the success noted here was the um, increased satisfaction, improved victim satisfaction with police services. Is that an outcome um, that it should be aimed for? Is, is that the priority? For me, the priority would be to reduce risk to victims rather than to improve um, their satisfaction with the police. So again, I've got a little bit of scepticism about this project. And if we're talking about cultures, and me not having an academic background, I think I'm now quite um, ensconced in academia. I get a little bit academically snobby about this particular uh, piece of research because the two people that conducted this research were from the business school in the University of Leicester. So my questions around this were what, what kind of experience and background did they have of DV? Um, because it seemed they were approaching it from the emphasis of let's improve the victim satisfaction with police services rather than getting at some of the real root problems of DV. So these are the kind of random control trials and the kind of developments that were going on at the time I was doing my research. And here's me coming along and saying, well, actually, I want to look at this qualitatively. I want to look at this across the board. I want to see everything you do 
in terms of responding to DV. I want to see the interactions between officers and victims. So it kind of sat at odds with this type of research where I'd be able to give them a very clear answer about, you know, doing A, B and C will result in this positive outcome. Um, so perhaps not necessarily viewed as, as, as so uh, popular. Sorry, Angie, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> I've spoken for too long already. I think what I, there's plenty more slides there. So when Svetlana shares them, you can get them there. But the kind of message that I was getting around to was the idea that despite all of these types of interventions, the issues that lie underneath regarding police culture are significant. Um, and that's what the slides go on to show, really. Some of the issues that go from the 90s, I've taken really from the 1990s right up to today, looking at police abuse of, of power to perpetrate sexual violence, looking at discrimination faced by women police officers within the force. The, in terms of the, the um, abuses of power to perpetrate sexual violence, over 30% of the victims that, that have been identified um, of police officers that have perpetrated sexual violence against them, over 30% are from the domestic violence victims. So in particular, seems to be honing in on domestic violence victims and their vulnerabilities and just the general lack of understanding um, around the risks posed to domestic violence victims means that these issues are not being addressed or responded to effectively. Police culture, of course, in, in um, recent times and, and currently has been highlighted with the outing of Cressida Dick most recently, um, even if you listen to her talk she when she resigned um very defensive um and almost not sorry it's, it's, it was like a sorry not sorry um but it wasn't very apologetic um and very defensive one of those key fa features of, of police culture as well as the sexism and the racism etc um but serious action needed in terms of being able to root out police culture um I'm waffling now, I'm, I'm conscious because I didn't get to go through to where I wanted to go through to. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to stop talking now and I'll get to around to other issues once other people have spoken probably more effectively than me. And um, I will answer questions at the end that anyone has in terms of police's responses to domestic violence. Thank you. Okay, Th thanks very much, Angie. This was a Actually, very, very good uh, kind of uh, introduction and uh, exposition of all the key issues and, uh, that, that uh, we face when looking at domestic violence. And I'm sure we will pick up uh, things uh, during the discussion. Uh, so, so, so now I would like uh, to give the floor to Amy Bedos, uh, who is a PhD student. Uh, at London Met, and um, uh, Amy is also uh, a part of, from from doing her PhD and, and working with uh, Quasar uh, Center uh, Ch Child and Woman Abuse Studies Unit. Uh, also works as a trauma therapist, and she has a special interest in media representations of violence against women. So, so thanks very much, uh, Amy. Uh, just uh, sh uh, share, yeah. Uh, that's great. Thank you. So, so Amy, you have uh, twenty minutes, maybe twenty-two, if you could, please. <laughs> I'll do my best, Svetlana. Thank you, and thanks, Angie. It's great seeing all the all the messages pop up about how interesting people found your talk, and your your men reference of um, police defensiveness is going to be really interesting in terms of my talk. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Amy Beddoes and uh, I'm going to be talking about police responses uh, and what those tell us about victim blame, misogynoir and violence against women in the UK. So I wanted to start my talk with just a very brief note about my position. As Svetlana said, I'm a PhD student with Kwasu uh, and my research is <laughs> into women's experiences of victim blame from agencies uh, and this is following sexual violence. So that's my area of interest and what I've really noticed in my research is that, that was, I, well, I didn't get to go through half of it. Um, that one thing I really noticed in my research is that while 
a lot of women are blamed and dismissed and devalued. They're blamed and dismissed in different ways. And that's something I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about particularly women of colour and how police respond to their abuse and their murder. And just to give you a, a positioning, I guess, of where I'm coming from. For those of you who can't see my camera, I am a white woman. And I'm very aware that that's bringing my standpoint into this issue. I'm going to be mentioning sexual violence, racism, misogyny, femicide, the murder of women. But I'm not going to I'm not going to include any graphic description of violence and I'm not going to use any discriminatory terms. I'm also not going to mention the abusers because I don't want to. Um, and I'm going to look at police responses to these cases, but also other people who have visible platforms, uh, politicians, other sort of high profile people in the media, because I think it's all important and, and I'll explain why. I've, I've included my email address. It'll be on the last slide as well. If anyone has any questions or thoughts or wants to contribute to this, please do get in touch with me. Um, and this is a tough topic. I found this really hard to put this presentation together. Um, so please look after yourselves. If you need to step out, if you need to take a moment, do. And that's the therapist side of me coming through in case you hadn't noticed. So I'm going to start with some key concepts that I want to discuss the issue of police responses sort of framed within these. Um, the first is victim blame. And I'm sure a lot of people will have heard this phrase and be familiar with it. But to give you a very brief um, definition, it's the process of making victims and survivors of sexual violence either partly partially responsible or fully responsible for what's happened to them. And this often comes through comments and judgments on their appearance or their behavior or their lifestyles. Um, as being uh, precipitating the assault or provoking the assault in ways that overlook the perpetrators, the criminal justice system and wider society. And all of those factors obviously have a, play, a place to play, a role to play in sexual violence. Responsabilization is similar to victim blame. It's not as well known and it's a lot more insidious. So this is making victims and survivors, or indeed anyone, it isn't just related to sexual violence, but it's making people responsible for things other than just the fact they've experienced violence. So this might be making people responsible for how they're coping after violence or any health issues they have or their parenting skills or their socioeconomic status or their housing. And it's it's very insidious because it's also very adaptive. We can always find something to blame or responsibilize someone for. And it's very normalized because at the moment in society, we do have a very individualistic approach to things. And, and this has been linked to neoliberalism and risk prevention man and management. This idea that the focus of change is the individual most affected, not all the other factors that contribute to it. So I'm going to talk a bit about some examples of responsabilization, which hopefully will make that a bit clearer. I also wanted to mention intersectionality. Again, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this term. It was created by the American academic Kimberly Crenshaw in her amazing paper, Mapping the Margins. Highly recommend it if you haven't read it. And she talks a lot about how different structural oppressions intersect. And the example she specifically focuses on is race and gender, but it can also include class and poverty, socioeconomic status. It's this idea that, for example, black women are treated differently to white women, even though gender is a common identity component. But black women are also treated differently to black men, even though there's a, a, a similar um, racial or ethnic background component. And that these different layers of oppression are, are, can be more than the sum of their parts because they intersect. And as well as race and ethnicity and cultural identity, this can be related to other oppressions in line with someone's religion, their age, their sexuality, gender identity, their ability and their class. So there's lots of different layers that can really contribute to someone's experience of oppression or discrimination and intersect in this way. A related concept um, has come from Moya Bailey, who's also an American academic. Um, she's termed this misogynoir, which is the specific uh, anti-black racist misogyny that black women experience. So she goes even deeper into this concept and she speaks about it or she writes about it a lot in relation to kind of media and uh, media reporting and media description of, of black women and how they're presented. And it intersects with this notion of colorism, which is discrimination based on skin tone. And if you if you're interested in this and you want to look for sort of real life modern examples, if you look at the, uh, the political commentary, particularly attacks against black female MPs such as Dawn Butler or Diane Abbott, you will notice a difference in terms of the sort of the way people talk to them, the attacks that are thrown at them, both in terms of content and volume compared to other female MPs, male MPs and male black MPs. So I think it's, it's a very interesting way to look at that is through just looking at Twitter and the kind of Twitter comments they get on their profiles is, is quite illuminating in terms of misogynoir. 
So in terms of having introduced those concepts, I guess I should really say, why do I think this is an important topic to look at at all? Why do, why do police and media responses to the abuse and murder of women, why do they matter? And I'd say they matter for quite a few reasons. Firstly, it could easily be argued that actually they reflect the view of these institutions as a whole. So if a politician says something or a police chief says something or a PCC, in theory, that could be representing how that whole institution thinks about the issue. And these institutions that are supposed to protect us, that are supposed to put things in place to prevent abuse, violence and murder from happening. These responses as well, particularly from people that have a very visible platform, such as an MP who has a lot of followers or when the police release a statement or someone's interviewed in the press, they really influence public attitudes. And that's in particular around issues that the public have not experienced. So if we don't have personal experience of sexual violence or the murder of women or racism, we're going to form our opinions of those issues from what we see in the media. So it influences how we see these issues. And they also become part of what Professor Liz Kelly has called the conducive context to violence against women. So if the messages out there say that some women are less deserving of protection or justice, or that actually the abuse of women is their fault and it's not an issue, that creates a culture where the abuse of women continues. It doesn't challenge it, it doesn't prevent it, it kind of enables it. These sorts of responses, if they're not positive and they're not proactive, they also maintain rape myths which are these very stereotypical, inaccurate myths and assumptions about rape, about the causes of rape, about rapists and about victims. And they also maintain this idea that there's a hierarchy of victims, that some women are less or more deserving of violence or even murder than other women based on lifestyle, based on personal characteristics, based on a whole range of things. And hopefully you can see from this list, these are all really bad things. And anything that reinforces these things, we need to address and we need to find ways of changing it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to move to speaking about several women who have been murdered in the last few years. And I'm going to look at some of the responses their murders had in the press from people with these visible platforms. Um, I've tried to include as much information as I could find about the women. And as you'll see, in some cases, there wasn't a lot, um, which in itself says something. So I'm going to start with Bobby Ann McLeod. She was an 18 year old student who was murdered in Plymouth in November 2021, so very recently. She went missing from a bus stop on her way to meet friends in town. So the quote I've chosen is from the Conservative leader of the City Council, Nick Kelly, and he said in an interview with ITV News, everybody has a responsibility to try and not put themselves in a compromising position. And that statement was in direct reference to the murder of Bobby Ann. Now, if you think of that statement and think about what it says to you, You'll probably come to the same conclusion that a lot of people did that his suggestion was she had put herself in a compromising position and therefore what happened to her was her fault and her responsibility he went on to say women should not need to be concerned about where they're walking or what they're wearing but he added it's probably not where we are right now now even by saying that women shouldn't be concerned about what they're wearing or where they're going it's drawing attention to somehow the idea of what people are wearing or where they're, where they're walking what they're doing is somehow linked to what happened to them so even by saying that isn't an issue, he's made it an issue. Just if you're interested, um, Bobby Ann went missing from a bus stop at 6 p.m. in the evening. It wasn't late at night. She was going into town to meet friends. She'd arranged to meet them. So even if we're looking at what a compromising position is, a woman getting a bus at 6 in the evening is apparently a compromising position. So this is what we mean when we talk about victim blame, but also this responsabilization. It's women's responsibility to not be in compromising positions when it comes to preventing their violence and their murder. So I'm going to talk about Sarah Everard, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with her case. It's gained a huge amount of um, media attention. And so did Philip Allett, who was the um, Police and Crime Commissioner for North Yorkshire at the time. The first quote from him uh, was from an interview with BBC News, I believe. And he said, so women, first of all, and this is in direct reference to Sarah Everard's murder, women need to be streetwise about when they can be arrested and when they can't be arrested. She should never have been arrested and submitted to that. And this is in reference to the fact that the man who murdered Sarah was a serving police officer and he used those credentials to arrest her as a means of abducting her. And what Philip Allett is saying is this was a false arrest. He had no uh, grounds to arrest her. She should have somehow known this and she should not have submitted to this arrest. I'd love to have a conversation with Philip and ask him what he thinks would have happened if she'd at the time said, no, you're not arresting me. I'd just be really interested to, to see how he thinks that would have played out. And he went on to say, women need to consider in terms of the legal process and learn a bit about it. So again, we've got a bit of blame there. She should not have submitted to him arresting her. It's her fault. And responsabilization. Women in general, we need to be more aware of the legal process so we know when we're being falsely or accurately arrested. 
Now, perhaps not surprisingly, his comments were, were critiqued by quite a few different people. And he took to Twitter to try and explain himself. Um, I'd argue he ended up doubling down on the point by saying, nobody's blaming the victim. What I'm saying is we need to inform women far better of their rights. So again, it's not Sarah's fault that she was murdered, but if she'd been more aware of her rights, dot, dot, dot. So I think, again, this really illustrates how these conversations, again, from people with a high visibility, from someone who has a high position of power when it comes to policing and keeping people safe, this victim blame, responsabilization, it's incredibly common and it's quite insidious. I'm going to move on to Libby Squire. She was a 21 year old philosophy student um, studying at Leeds University and she was murdered in February 2019 on her way home from a night out. So the man who murdered her was caught. He's been charged and during the case, um, the, the prosecuting QC described Libby as drunk and vulnerable. And they use this phrase quite a few times. Now, the reason this sticks out is by focusing on the vulnerabilities of the victim. Again, we're drawing attention to this being a potential reason why she was murdered. And the implied suggestion is if she hadn't been drunk, if she hadn't been vulnerable, this man wouldn't have killed her. Now, we don't know if that's true. And it almost suggests a causality that if she hadn't been drunk and vulnerable, this man might not have murdered anyone, which removes any agency or choice from him. Interestingly, um, the police have said how 19 people, including the man who killed her, interacted with Libby on her way home from the night out. Um, if we're looking at blaming and we're looking at responsabilizing, I think it's really interesting that none of those 19 people, or well, other than the man who killed her, none of those 18 people have been blamed or responsabilized in any way for preventing what happened. I'm not saying they should be, but I think it's interesting that if we're looking to appropriate individual blame, it's always on the woman who's been murdered, no one else in that circle. And I think Libby's mother, Lisa Squire, she sums it up beautifully with a, a statement she made in reference to what was said about her daughter at the trial, which was Libby wasn't vulnerable. People say that, but she wasn't. She had every right to be out and having a drink that night. What made her vulnerable was the fact that there are monsters out there. So she really draws attention to actually maybe rather than focusing on women's rights, uh, rather than focusing on what women are doing and knowing their rights and not making themselves vulnerable, maybe we should focus on women's rights to be out having a drink, having a night out, the freedom, the space that they're allowed to occupy. And statements like this, drunk and vulnerable, they do the opposite of that. I'm going to move on to women of colour because the first three women I spoke about were white and we've seen different ways that they were blamed and responsabilised and their vulnerabilities were sort of brought into question. Um, as we'll see, other things are alluded to when police and media respond to the abuse and murder of women of colour. So again, you might be familiar um, with Bibba Henry and Nicola Smallman, who were sisters. Um, Bibba was 46 and she was a senior social worker. Nicola, or Nikki to her friends, was 27 and she was a photographer. And in June 2020, they were out celebrating Bibba's birthday in a local park in Wembley. Now, I wanted to add to this because this is something that's often overlooked in that they were celebrating out in a park as this was during lockdown and they were obeying the restrictions that were in place at the time. So if they had been celebrating at home or anywhere else, they would have been breaking the law. And I, I say that because I've seen some people saying, why were they out in a park? That's why. So they were reported missing by their family when they weren't home by the early morning. Police did not initially search. Mina Smallman, who is the mother of, of the two women, she said, I knew instantly why they didn't care. And that's referencing the police. They didn't care because they looked at my daughter's address and they thought they knew who she was, a black woman who lives on a council estate. So in Nina's opinion, the police made an assumption based on who her daughter was and, and, and the judgments they'd made about where she lived, about whether or not they should actually search. And in the end, they, they didn't. So they're missing, the, the reports of them missing were not taken seriously, purely based on who these women were. Now, both women were found by Nikki's partner 36 hours after they were first reported missing in the park where they'd been partying and where they died. I'm not going to go hugely into it because, um, again, I'm sure people will have picked up on this in the news and it's, it's really horrific. But um, after their bodies were found, police turned up. They put around a cordon to protect the women and to protect the evidence of the crime scene. And a couple of officers took some photos and sent them in a group chat to other officers with some really hideous, disrespectful language. Um, they've been charged with misconduct, but this shows that even, even when women are dead and they've been murdered, their deaths aren't taken seriously, particularly women of colour. So even after the two sisters were found clearly murdered, police were disrespecting them. 
and I didn't have time to add it to the slides, but there was a, an interview with Mina Smallman earlier this week. She said how uh, in relation to the, this part of the case, she met with Cressida Dick, Dame Cressida Dick, who apologised and said she was appalled and it was a one off and, and, you know, it would never happen again. And this was, as we now know, at the time when she was aware that this was happening in other WhatsApp groups, there was a lot of misogyny and racism and other stuff going around. So in Mina Smallman's words, she felt she was gaslit by Cressida Dick, who told her it's not that big a deal. It's a one off and it won't happen. So even to the family of the bereaved, this level of dismissal and disrespect continues to kind of ripple out. I want to move on to Mirakan Jan MJ Mustafa, MJ to her friends. She was a mother of three who lived in East London and she was last seen uh, at a family event in May in 2018. She was reported missing two days later by her family when they weren't able to get hold of her. And a very similar thing. Um, police didn't really search for MJ. And actually, her sister ended up doing an awful lot of um, the investigation. She went door to door. She spoke to neighbours in the area. She asked people um, who were living nearby if she could access her CCTV. She passed this on to police and it wasn't examined until much later. In fact, the police gave her an unofficial warning saying, you need to stop looking into this. You need to let us do our job. But from MJ's family's perspective, she wasn't being looked for. She was found in April 2019, almost a year after she got missing. And the reason she was found was because the man who murdered her was reported missing and police went to look for him. And in the trial of the man who killed her, who was also convicted of murdering another woman, the prosecutor, Duncan Penny, he said, both women, MJ and his other victim, uh, they were vulnerable women living somewhat chaotic lives. And he made reference to periods of homelessness and also drug addiction. So again, we've got this focus on vulnerabilities in addition to her being missing, not taken seriously. So this is layer upon layer upon layer of different ways that these responses contribute um, to disrespect and also not protect women. I won't share much more about this case. It is a, a pretty horrific case. And if you do want to read up about it, um, I will just give you a heads up. It's really awful. So I wanted to share Blessing as well. Um, Blessing Olusegun, and there's not a huge amount about her in the media. She was a 21 year old business student who was living in Greenwich and she was also training to be a carer. So she was on a placement in East Sussex for a week, I think it was, um, working at a care facility for older people with dementia and mental health problems. And in September 2020, she was found dead on the beach, not far from where she was staying and not, and not far from where she was working. There's very little about her situation out there um, in the public domain. But one of the things police said is that she spoke to her boyfriend a couple of hours before her body was found. And she said she asked him to stay on the phone with her. Her police have since said uh, her family have since said, well, we know that means something was up. You know, why would she say that to him unless she was afraid or she was worried about something? But the police have said her death is unexplained, but not suspicious. And there's no evidence of a crime. And we're currently waiting for a full inquest. She died in September 20. But we're, we're still waiting to find out exactly what happened to her. I haven't included any quotes um, because there aren't any, to be honest. And most of what I found out about Blessing was in news articles talking about how little news reporting there was on her death in comparison to someone like Sarah Everard. So um, it made me quite sad, actually, that I couldn't even share much more about her with you because there just isn't a lot out there. And again, little investigation and even less reporting. So Sabina Nessa, who I think people will be more familiar with because I feel her case got a lot more coverage in the press. Um, she was a 28 year old primary school teacher in Greenwich and she was murdered in September 21 while walking to meet a friend. And for those of you who, who followed the case or read the stories, it was a very short walk. She was meeting a friend at a pub. I think she went through a local park. It was like a five minute walk uh, and she was found the next day uh, in the park where she'd been murdered. Now, I was looking uh, at the police, you know, police comments about the case and politicians, and most of it actually seemed quite respectful. And I thought, oh, maybe maybe this is getting better. You know, this is relatively recent. Maybe people have learned from some of the criticism following Sarah Everard and other other women's um, how they were reported. And I found this tweet by the Duchess of Cambridge. I'm saddened by the loss of another innocent young woman on our streets. My thoughts are with Sabina's family and friends. All those have been affected by this tragic event. I mean, it's a beautiful tweet. I have no reason to think it's not heartfelt. But what jumped out was the use of the word innocent. By including the word innocent there to describe Sabina, that suggests that some women who die on our streets are less innocent or not innocent. And I think even though that there was probably a really good intention in this, it feeds into this notion that there's a hierarchy of victims. Some women are innocent and don't deserve it. Logically, therefore, some women are less innocent or not innocent and do deserve it. 
So even when things are reported in a way that seems positive and feels quite sensitive, it can still reinforce this insidious narrative that's underneath the surface. Okay, the final woman I'm gonna to mention today is Yasmin or Yaz Shukifi. She was a 43 year old childminder who was also studying for a master's degree. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out what her degree was in. And uh, she's a mother of two living in Maida Vale. She was murdered by her ex-partner in January 2020. Um, and you may have heard of it because it was mostly reported in the news because uh, her ex-partner murdered her in the street and then a passerby in their car ran over her ex-partner trying to save Yaz's life. Um, that was the bit that was reported most. At the time of her murder, there was a stalking prevention order that had been in place because her ex-husband had um, committed a lot of abuse and a lot of threats against her. But he had breached it three weeks earlier and there was a warrant out for his arrest. And uh, a friend of Yaz's had said in the press that two years previously, her friend had said she thought she would die her ex-husband's hands. So she had been saying this for a long time, that she thought he was going to kill her. And not a huge amount was done, to be honest. She'd reported multiple times of violence, of threats to the police over the years. And although a stalking prevention order had been put in place, it, it did nothing. She also lived very close to her ex-husband. So even though he breached the order and there was a warrant for his arrest that was in, active for three weeks before he killed her, police didn't pick him up. They didn't arrest him. And the local councillor, Jeff Baraclough, said there was a warrant out for his arrest, but the police failed in this basic task. Her murderer should not have been walking the streets. He should have been in jail. And this was backed up by Yaz's son, Zaid Bakali, who said this could have been avoided. He lives so near, I'd literally see him on a monthly basis and police would do nothing. So she had reported to the police, she'd reported multiple times to the point that they also had enough evidence that they felt a stalking prevention order was, was feasible. But even though he breached the order, nothing was done and he was free to murder her. So again, this demonstrates how little women of colour's fears, their abuse is taken seriously. And even though we have the tools in place, they're not used. They're not used in a way that actually keeps women safe and prevents them from being murdered. So I wanted to have some kind of conclusion to all this that wasn't just really depressing because I'm mindful this is a tough topic and it's actually, it's, it's pretty hard to sort of think about all these women and read about their stories in such a short truncated space. But I think the way people have spoken about them and the way it's been reported really sums up victim blame and responsabilization is looking for someone else to shift the blame onto and women are blamed and made responsible or they're dismissed or they're not taken seriously or they're ignored or their vulnerabilities are, are, are brought to the front. And this fits in line with this hierarchy of victims with women of color bearing the brunt of this more than white women. And I saw this tweet from Naza Afsal, um, who's a solicitor and a former chief prosecutor. And I thought, yeah, that's it. He's nailed it. So this was in response to Dame Cresta Dick resigning and the Metropolitan Police Federation having quite a shady response themselves saying that they'd lost faith. They had no faith in Sadiq Khan as if it was Sadiq Khan's fault, all of this. And as Nazir comments, well, just a thought, London citizens might have lost faith in police because of accusations that some are racist, corrupt, misogynistic, homophobic, sharing pictures of dead black women, secretly filming women, not dealing with officers nicknamed the rapist who end up murdering women. And I think this really sums up responsabilization that even when it's got to the point that the chief commissioner or, or whatever her role was, Presta Dick resigns, the, the police are still blaming someone else. It's Sadiq Khan's fault. They're making it anyone else's fault but themselves. And as Angie said in her talk, you know, we don't know. We, we have no way of knowing if police had responded differently in all these cases, whether these women would still be alive. But we do know that while the conversations around women still centers them and responsabilizes them as being the reason that they are murdered and abused, we're, we're not gonna do anything to change violence against women. It's just gonna keep enabling it. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, just a reminder, do take care of yourself. You know, the topics of all these talks tonight, they're heavy, they're, they're really intense. Um, I decided to light a little candle for the women that I'm speaking about. So maybe you might wanna do the same, but just do something tonight to look after yourselves, have a talk with someone you love, have a bath, look after yourselves. And I've got my email address there if anyone has any comments or thoughts they want to share with me after the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Amy, for this very uh, affecting talk, uh, which also looks deeply in, 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 into responsibilization of women and the fact that women are supposed to take some kind of risk assessment before going out or, or uh, when it comes to their relationships. So, so this, these are very important uh, topics and ideas. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, so, so now uh, we, we move on uh, to our next uh, presentation is by Dr. Will Hughes. Uh, Will is a senior lecturer in criminology at our university and his previous career was with, uh, with the probation uh, service. Uh, Will used to be a probation officer, uh, practice teacher, and uh, specialist with domestic abuse perpetrators. So uh, his uh, research is based upon his practical experience of uh, conducting uh, sessions uh, probably, uh, with domestic abuse perpetrators, male, male perpetrators, and he will tell us about his experience and um, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, how, how we, we can actually work with domestic abuse perpetrators in a way that they are not um, shamed, but, but, but that they are helped to reconsider their behavior and become better people, if possible. So, so I'll, I'll just uh, share Will's uh, file. Or maybe, yeah. So we'll, we'll it's over to you. Thanks, Svetlana, and thank you, Angie and Amy. Really reflecting quite carefully about the content um, of Angie and Amy's discussion and some of the you know, very powerful messages about uh, the serious injuries and deaths uh, that women sustain regularly and in high volumes uh, over successive years. And there's a tension with me now turning attention to actually working with perpetrators, because this is actually a contentious area. I think for many of the reasons that Angie and Amy have touched on, the arrest and conviction of men who are violent towards women uh, is, in, is, is incredibly low uh, it, when held against uh, the frequency of violence towards women in relationships or outside of relationships. So there are legitimate debates around whether or not this is something we should be doing at all. Uh, Svetlana nicely summarised there about yeah this talk, uh, my discussion and my interests around how how we can effectively work with men to make them less violent, to make them less hostile, aggressive and less risky. But there are big dilemmas around whether or not this is a legitimate investment of resources when actually safeguarding women in the first place is something which hasn't by any means uh, been achieved. In fact, there seems to be very little progress without wanting to be too dismissive or uh, pessimistic. I, I, those debates though are beyond, um, largely beyond the input I wanna give today, which is around, well, okay, acknowledging that many men have histories of violence, particularly within relationships for the purposes of this talk, what should we do uh, with them? What should we do to reduce their risks? And there's the development of perpetrator programs has, has become a key intervention in uh, trying to reduce domestic violence. Uh, sending men who've been convicted onto specific programs uh, is something which is now quite well established. And there's been substantial debate. The key debate is, well, what should these programs look like? What should their content be? What should men be taught that will help them be less violent and will therefore as a consequence make the women that they live with, make ex-partners or future partners less at risk? And also, you know, again, fitting in with Amy and Angie's themes, it's very much having a focus on holding men to account for their behavior as opposed to traditional responses that continue to uh, place responsibility at the hands of victims. So like I say, most evaluation of programs, of perpetrator programs that are designed to decrease violence among men are discussed around content. What is it that men need? And there's a key split, and I'm trying not to go into too much detail, between two overall approaches. One that says fundamentally uh, men are violent because they have a particular understanding of masculinity that's associated with misogyny and um, 
hatred of women and in particular entitlement uh which uh it, that, a set of beliefs that they are entitled to have to, to tell women what to do and to punish women when women don't do uh, according to their expectations there's another kind of overall approach which tries to emphasize that m the men who are most violent and who are most damaged uh, have incredible experiences of trauma themselves in their own backgrounds and often significant skill deficits in their ability to manage their own emotions. There are criticisms of both. But, and, and also that's a simplistic characterization. But what is given less attention is, is the area which I'm most interested in is actually when you speak to men who've been on perpetrator programs or when you spend time uh, actually delivering perpetrator programs, watching what's going on. The key part of the experience are the dynamics of that group room. It, group room, group or based perpetrator programs are not things that are just passively rolled out. You know, that, that if, um, you know, if the right content is delivered, that makes them effective. Effectiveness is also determined by the feel of the group, by the way the men interact with each other. And that affects how men engage with the material and what their experiences are within it. And it's those kind of dynamics that I'm interested in and wanting to explore uh, in previous research I've done and today briefly. So just to give you a flavour of uh, one of the key themes that stood out uh, to me in delivering perpetrator groups uh, and, and other groups as well, actually, is something I used to observe when I'd be sitting in the reception area of the probation office where I used to deliver accredited uh, pr uh, programs for perpetrators and I'd watch the men coming in to the waiting room. We'd wait until they were all there so we could get them all into the group room in one, uh, in one go. And what we'd see is the first man arriving quietly and then the second man arriving and the two would greet each other and shake hands. Uh, a third man, man would arrive and they'd be handshaking all around. There'd often be about 14 men. And what we see is an escalation of uh, male behaviours where the men would start cheering, greeting each other with increasing enthusiasm. And what I would argue is this is typical male behaviour and it reflects the gendered way in which perpetrator programmes operate. And we can see similar sets of behaviour when men meet in all sorts of locations. So if you want to do your own uh, empirical research on this kind of thing, you can go and watch men greet each other in a bar. When you've got a group of men, you get this kind of escalation of cheering and, and teasing and uh, banter. And this is a gendered dynamic, which very much affects the experiences of men who are attending programs and requires much more reflection if we're to maximize the effectiveness of perpetrator programs in achieving their outcomes. So to reassert that kind of uh, theme, my understanding of perpetrator groups is that they're gendered ecologies. They have lots of dynamics. They are experienced through the interactions that men have with each other. And those interactions are very much gendered. Men attend programs against a backdrop of ideas about what it means to be male. And this has implications for the effectiveness of programmes. The kind of interactions and the way they're managed can make programmes more effective or less effective. And there's a lack of data about exactly how these issues can operate. Key themes that I'm going to be uh, returning to is that uh, the, the, the men experience the programmes as a kind of threat to their gender. It's, it, it's a, a, the program itself requires them to navigate their masculinity uh, and, and in, in a complex way, which they do through interacting and expressing themselves with the other men. I won't go into too much detail here, but in trying to understand domestic abuse perpetrator programs and how they operate, I'm drawing on some key uh, theoretical frameworks uh, that I've alluded to implicitly already. Uh, uh, scholars like Connell, sorry I'm missing a five off of the, the two and the two and, and two zeros there, and Western Zimmerman and several other, others have talked about 
gender and masculinity as being a performance, something which isn't just fixed or static, but it's negotiated in interactions with other, other men. Men perform a particular version of masculinities and hope to achieve a certain interpretation of others that brings them status. Related to this, or less, though less um, explicitly about gender, is Irving Goffman's classic work, which, which talks about where he talks about us people being essentially actors on a stage. People perform an identity. So West and Zimmerman and Connell very much use Goffman's framework of performance, but explicitly in the context of gender. And another key strand that I'm using to understand group experiences is an American sociologist called Randall Collins, who talks about exchanges not just being rational, but they involve collective emotional energy. So when groups of people get together, their, their bodies start to synchronize, their emotions are infectious. I use an example of a football match or a, or a bar, but if you look at people in groups, there tends to be an emotional connection where people share experiences of anger, elation, laughter, uh, depression, despair. Th these are, again, things that factor into perpetrator groups. Won't go into too much detail uh, about the research which it's based on, but it involved me actually immersing myself into groups themselves, working as a facilitator uh, across lots and lots of groups where the uh, participants changed over periods of time and with different facilitators. So there are different individuals within the groups, but the patterns uh, transcended the groups themselves. So there is something about the dynamics of groups which transcend the individuals within them. And also there's consistency between two very different groups that I uh, was involved in, in facilitating and uh, uh, men who I was involved in interviewing had attended very different groups, but actually the things they said about it and the patterns were true irrespective of the, of the content, which again draws attention to the importance of dynamics and interactions and emotional experience over content. So just to identify some of the discernible things which are identified across those groups, a key element of uh, groups with, with violent men is that men initially display substantial resistance to attending the programme and they display this through hostility. And through talking to the men, what the way and using this, the frameworks I've described, a key way of understanding this resistance is that the program attendance was understood as emasculating, as undermining men's sense of masculinity in a number of ways. First of all, the men understood violence against women quite surprisingly as something which is profoundly shameful. Lots of writing uh, uh, about uh, male perpetrators has quite rightly highlighted that uh, uh, violence against women is often culturally justified. There are lots, lots of language that men use to justify their violence. However, equally, many of the men were, were, were contrasted violence against women with violence against men. Violence against men was presented as culturally celebrated, but violence against women, that, that was not something that they wanted to be associated with. So they would refute that they were appropriate for the, for the program. I am not one of those wife beaters. Wife beaters aren't real men. I did something that was just a once off. Interesting quote from Trevor here, who really captures that theme that, um, you know, the magistrates were impressed when they were sentencing me for being violent against men. I, I think, think we can question whether they were or not. But in Trevor's perception, the, the magistrates and other people were impressed with his ability to be violent towards men. But violence against women, that's shameful. So attitudes towards violence against women are very complex. Culturally endorsed, absolutely, it seems. However, equally, there are complexities that it's also associated with shame and emasculation. The group was also emasculating in other ways. Uh, it was seen as a feminized arena. The whole principle, the, the group would involve several chairs sat around in a circle with two facilitators with a lot of emphasis on talking. Uh, talking 
that's a feminized activity in the minds of the many of the men attending. So a couple of quotes here, and I apologize for the explicit nature of the swearing. I hope this isn't too offensive, but I want to capture the reality. Swearing is an important part in which men displayed their masculinity. But the key theme which kept re-emerging, sitting around talking, and especially talking about emotions, that's what women do. So uh, a particularly vocal character would say, you know, this is, this is, this is like a mother's meeting. Is it going to be sitting around talking like this every, every week? We should be getting on with stuff. And also the lack of it being directed to do things felt very uncomfortable. Expressing complex emotions was a feminized uh, arena for many of the men. Related to that, the very notion of learning, being taught, was seen as emasculating. Men of status, they know they don't need to learn. So being taught by someone, especially by someone who was often younger than them, not often in my case, but I was often co-facilitating with women who were much younger than the men in the group, this was again emasculating. Men couldn't quite cope with someone else younger than them being in, positioned in a role of teacher well, they hold held what, what they perceived as a subordinate role of the learner. And again, this was something men reacted against in whole in a whole series of ways. I don't need to learn any of this. I already know this. This is obvious. Actually, I've got more experience. I've been married 20 years. I should be teaching you about relationships with the kind of sentiments that men expressed initially. I shouldn't be here for all of these reasons. I shouldn't be here because I'm not one of those wife beaters. I shouldn't be here because I'm not going to get anything from sitting around and talking. I shouldn't be here because I already know it all. And these were masculinized, masculinized gendered statements, which were men were using to defend their sense of masculinity, which they perceived to be under threat by being at these programs. However, what's interesting is that the men don't respond to these problems individually. Using Randall Collins again, uh, what he has emphasized is that actually sustaining hostility is hard work and people are almost automatically hardwired in quite unusual language for a sociologist towards cooperation, towards dealing with problems collectively. So as programs progress from that initial, well, I shouldn't be here. This is all rubbish. I can't, I, I'm not going to listen to this stuff or I, I might turn up, but you know, this is all rubbish men start to have slightly more positive statements which uh, suggest positivity towards each other and a degree of acceptance about the program and start to reconcile attendance with the program with their own sense of masculinity. So other statements start to appear which show the men negotiating the threat posed by the program with a masculine sense of self. So statements like, well, OK, it's tough, but we're all in the same boat. We can get through it together. And statements like, well, you've got a man up. You know, all right, we might not like it, but real men, they accept it and get on with it. They don't complain. And it was interesting to watch the men socialize each other into the expectations of the program. So a good example was someone I'm referring to as Ryan, who uh, joined the program at a particular stage one of the programs was rolling which meant that new members were joining all the time and they join a group with older programs with people who've been on the program for some time and there'd be a process of socialization of newer members into how the program worked to, to kind of facilitate them not disrupting the experience so ryan was quite a young guy constantly saying i'm not going to be here doing with this rubbish this doesn't suit me all this woman's work i shouldn't be anywhere here anyway and you can see the other members in this series of quotes saying, look, it's all right. It's not that bad. You know, we can teach each other. It might, you know, it might be, might not be exactly what you want, but it's a collective negotiation of and reconciliation of masculinity with the program that enables men to actually engage and process the material. And it doesn't just stop there with most programs. In many of the programs I facilitated and observed, uh, it it wasn't just didn't just end at a, a point of acceptance. Men often became incredibly enthusiastic about the program and about their connection to the other men. The phrase, well, actually, when I started, I was all negative and I was uh, I was like you was something that people would say to new members. But actually, these are a great bunch of guys. 
So that was a phrase that was used so many times by so many different people within interviews and during the course of the programmes. It really does capture uh, what Randall Collins uh, refers to, drawing on Durkheim as collective effervescence. This sense of buzz within the room that facilitators often refer to when a programme is going well, where people share a positive sense of emotional energy and uh, uh, where there's a shared mutual focus on a particular uh, set of ideas or a particular experience. Uh, so I've borrowed, uh, actually, it was the suggestion of uh, Svetlana when I was writing my PhD, this notion of homosociality which is used to refer to the way in which men uh, often enjoy each other's company. And this often can reinforce negative and misogynistic attitudes, but it didn't always play out within the programs in this way. It, men often did show a willingness to actually engage and reflect on their masculinity and how they might review it, while also you know, accepting and reasserting some core aspects of what they understood as being male. But it was only within this sense when, when this group had been established as a safe space where masculinity could be kind of not demolished that men seemed to be able to express and share their relationship aspirations and what masculinity meant. And there's just a quote here that I'm not going to read out, but that you know, it'll be in the recording uh, that really captures you know, in an interview this sense of being in the same boat, camaraderie. And you know, very conscious as I'm saying this, this is, these are controversial ideas, you know, the idea of men who should be being held to account, you know, actually enjoying their experience and having positivity is, is one that is quite rightly deeply un uncomfortable and, and does require uh, substantial reflection. But ultimately, I think it's from the perspective of, of effectiveness that, that uh, I'm considering these uh, issues about how we ensure that groups encourage a critical reflection of, of masculinity, but also how they can exacerbate ideas about masculinity by putting groups of misogynistic men together uh, once a week for these kind of programmes. Some other key themes, perhaps reflecting that idea of how masculinity can be expressed things that were seen repetitively and I think will continue to be seen repetitively and probably have some familiarity to anyone who's run groups with men. S repetitive swearing seems to be a way in which men can talk about emotional content but still kind of get the masculinity in there. You know, remember, okay, I might be talking about um, my vulnerability, my sensitivity and how things have gone wrong, but if I swear intermittently severally, that kind of makes it sound more masculine handshaking and backslaps were some of the continuous masculine rituals in which men were affirmed uh, by each other to say look you know yeah you're doing all right we still respect you you're still kind of manly humor a bit like swearing has given been given lots of attention very controversial within you know, again when we're talking about holding violent men to account but humor had a very complex role it seemed to be a way of enabling men to manage some of the emotionally challenging material that was being discussed and also challenging and reasserting themselves to kind of almost put limits on what they're prepared to discuss. And it very much fits in with some of Colin, Randall Collins's work. The, the humour is a classic example where people share an emotional state and their body starts to contort noises, you know, laughter noises, you know, against people's will. But again, there are other perhaps more positive and optimistic aspects of masculinity which uh, started to emerge within the group. So the idea of actually being committed, of being resilient, of accepting responsibility, real men accepting responsibility and being willing to change and challenging ideas that you know, physical toughness was perhaps as important as it might be and, and sensitivity and being able to support other people and understand other people's emotions also emerged in some groups. But equally, there was lots of reassertions of very traditional, uh, quite uh, uh, macho ideas about what being a man meant throughout the programmes. And these would reappear even among men who seem to be making substantial progress. So displays of heterosexuality uh, and being attracted to particular women and constant references to having sex drives and want high sex drives and wanting sex were 
um, you know, were completely referenced. And the capacity to use physical violence and having had experience of physical violence was a really important ingredient. You didn't fit in the, into the group unless you had uh, a tough background with past experience of violence towards men. And this is very consistent with lots of other work that has explored uh, masculinity. I'm rushing through mindful of time. So that brings me to the end, uh, essentially, of, of, of my input, which I think it suggests further questions rather than uh, conclusions. It questions how the culture and the dynamics of perpetrator groups can impact on their effectiveness in bringing about change, as Fetlana said, in their effectiveness of bringing about um, enabling men to be more positive human beings, to have more nuanced understandings of masculinity and their gender and their capacity to harm other people. How the group culture can actually manage to mediate the defensiveness that many men exhibit. As I said, many men are very defensive when they come into the group room. If the group strategy is too confrontational, too challenging, men won't engage. So balancing those tensions of holding men to account while equally engaging them in a complex process uh, is something which needs careful exploration. And as I say, I think it's been overlooked uh, because of the emphasis on content of group-based programs. And I've, I've really observed some incredibly skilled staff uh, throughout my career uh, in working with violent men. But what I have noticed is this is largely down to what staff bring themselves to the training room. A lot of the training they've received is around the content of the particular program they're delivering, what needs to be covered rather than how it needs to be covered. The training for domestic violence group facilitators is incredibly restricted. Um, so, so there are real implications for enabling staff to be adequately supported a uh, colleague of mine in the University of Durham and uh, an, another in University of Stirling is, is, are, are doing some research around this at the moment, but how staff should be enabled to navigate these complex issues. So I hope I didn't uh, go too quickly there, but, 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 but equally enabled you to, to get a sense of what um, some of my research has been about. But that brings me to the end and the next set of slides are just some references for anyone who might want to be interested and my contact details. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Will, and thank you for, for, for keeping the time. Uh, it was a fascinating presentation which uh, showed the very creative application of social theory to, to practice and something that I'm sure can have, can have very interesting and important uh, practical implications as well. So now, now we are moving on to our next and final presentation by uh, Joanna Lovett uh, from Quasi. Uh, Joanna is a research fellow uh, at, at uh, Quasi, and uh, she she looks at the issues around uh, domestic violence, uh, gender violence, uh, uh, especially support services, criminal justice responses, and many many other uh, issues which are important. Uh, and, and which we would like now uh, Joe to talk about uh, for 20 minutes, if possible. So I, I will share uh, share Joe's presentation. Um, uh, right. Okay, thank, you. thank you. That's great. Thanks a lot, Svetlana. And um, thanks to all the other speakers. Um, I think it's been a really interesting order of, um, of topics and that they've, they've flowed really well together. And hopefully mine will um, follow on nicely from, from Will's presentation and, and the others. Um, so the, the topic I'm going to speak about is um, is related to some recent uh, evaluation work that we've done in Kwazu that I've done with colleagues, particularly with Liz Kelly um, uh, and others. Um, and it's about uh, a con the concept of space for action and, and how that relates to um, the work that we've um, observed and taken part in uh, relating to 
uh, domestic violence perpetrators as well as uh, survivors. Um, so just a brief outline of what I'm going to try to cover, um, hoping that I'll be able to fit it all in. Um, I'm just going to start by giving you a very, very uh, potted um, context of, of, of some of the elements of the changing uh, policy and practice landscape in, in domestic violence perpetrator work. Um, and in parallel to that, because we've been doing work on this topic for um, several decades, I mean, I've, I've been in Quasi for about just over 20 years, so I've not been involved in all of that work, but um, I have been, um, been around for quite a bit of it. In parallel with that, I want to just note some of the kind of landmark pieces of work that Quasi has done in this field. Um, and, uh, and after that, speak a, a bit about this concept of space for action um, in, as it relates to survivors um, in the way that we've articulated it originally. Um, and then how through these two recent studies that we've done um, that focused more on um, domestic violence perpetrators, that we've expanded our thinking about this concept of space for action as a way of understanding ways of working with perpetrators. Um, so I'm just starting in sort of late 80s, early and 1990s um, with this concept of the coordinated community response, which came from the US um, originally, um, the Duluth model, um, which was a systemic uh, response combining safety for survivors with accountability for perpetrators, um, but that importantly also involved shared principles practice across different agencies. And our work on this period, um, this is before my time in the unit, um, was uh, was conducted by, um, I've referenced this, I think I've referenced this wrongly here, I think it's actually Sheila Burton, who was a lead author, but anyway, Burton et al, um, Sheila, Liz and um, Linda conducted this work on the DVIP project, the Domestic Violence Intervent Intervention Project. Um, which was local to our university. Um, and in that work, uh, which looked at um, the Duluth project that combined work with perpetrators and um, work to support survivors, uh, one of the key lessons that we, we drew from that was the importance of safety planning um, and um, advocacy for women and also of the co-location and kind of linked nature of those two sides of the work with both survivors and perpetrators. And then moving into the 2000s, we see um, a change in the framing of work around dom domestic violence and a move from um, more of a sort of safety based framing to a risk based framing with the introduction of things like the DASH risk assessment, um, the role of um, IDVA's independent domestic violence. Um, advisors and 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 Marax um, and so that there are more there's a, a tendency towards ways of working that are around crisis intervention um, more structured and more time limited sessions for um, supporting survivors uh, and in some of the work that that we did during that period we see the tendency for um, the reduction of risk be focused on survivors rather than perpetrators um, and, and one of the pieces of work that we did at this time was done by our former colleague Maddie Coy and Liz Kelly. Um, it's called Islands in the Stream that evaluated several IDFA projects. Um, uh, and again, this, this threw up the role and the importance of independent advocacy for survivors, but also um, some of the gaps in the, in the so-called coordinated community response and also some issues um, with the way that Marax were operating. One uh, legislative change during this period was um, in the introduction of domestic violence protection orders or DDPOs, which were um, a, a kind of move that recognised in, in some ways that with a perpetrator still present in at the home environment after a report of domestic of a domestic violence related um, offence, they were still able to exert power and control over the over the survivor and that women's space to consider what options they might have and what action, if any, they wish to take is seriously curtailed by their presence. 
And so to some extent, these orders, which um, enabled the removal for a, a brief, a limited period of the perpetrator from the property, uh, along with certain conditions in some cases, um, kind of provided some space for action. This concept I'll come on to a bit more in a moment. Um, and space was valued by some of the survivors that we, we interviewed, and we did actually see some reduction in the level of repeat domestic violence incidents in the cases where DVPOs were applied. And then coming on to more recent, the more recent period, kind of following or linking to the work that Will, the kind of work that Will's been talking about in his presentation, um, we did a uh, and we did a project um, in collaboration with colleagues at Durham University, um, which was a large scale project looking at a number of um, domestic violence perpetrator programs and how and whether they work in reducing men's violence and how we can hold more perpetrators to account given the limited number of men that are accessing those programs and that the criminal justice approach alone is not does not appear to be enough. Um, and we did in this work see some clear shifts resulting from men's engagement in these programs um, uh, through their group through the group work, particularly around their understandings of violence and abuse. And there was some reduction in the women's uh, the women's experiences, the women who were associated with the, the men that were uh, evaluated as part of this, this project, in their experiences of subsequent uh, physical and sexual violence. And interestingly, linking to what Will said, um, the role of gender was something that was highlighted in the in the study is really relevant, um, and that um, that where men changed, a key way in which they did change was in developing different ways of being a man in their, their relationships with their partners or ex-partners and children. So, just to very briefly summarise some of the kind of key elements of responses to domestic abuse perpetrators that we picked up during the um, period of, of doing work on this topic um, is the primacy of um, the criminal justice approach in, in this country to, to perpetrators. Um, that, that domestic violence perpetrator programmes are um, often operating without a full and effective um, community, coordinated community response in the way that it was originally envisaged in the Duluth project um, around them. Um, that the key based response is very much limited to um, voluntary sector services, often those supporting survivors, um, and that risk assessment and those risk based processes usually focuses unfortunately on those who are at risk um, to the detriment of, uh, of those who are creating the risk, um, and the, i.e. The, the perpetrators. Also there was a, an emphasis on high risk cases um, and the sort of prioritisation of, of who is deserving of, of what type of support. Um, and also linking to what um, Amy said in her presentation and this concept of responsi responsibilisation um, in a lot of the work uh, on perpetrators we find the tendency to um, focus more on survivors and responsibilise them um, and so that has always left us asking but what about him what about the perpetrator and the action to, um, uh, to, to, to challenge him. So in a project um, that uh, was conducted by Liz uh, along, alongside um, Nicola uh, Sharp, a former colleague who set, went on to set up um, surviving the Surviving Economic Abuse Charity, and a number of uh, other colleagues um, over the years who participated in this um, kind of longitudinal long-term research project called Finding the Cost of Freedom. We developed this concept, um, which we utilise a lot now, um, of space for action in, uh, in, our, in our work more broadly on domestic violence. So, space for action is a concept that recognises that the confidence and capacity of survivors is undermined by processes of abuse um, limit that limit their physical, psychological, social, financial 
autonomy and resources and basically narrow their life and their options. So it's not just about controlling their movements and their behaviour, but actually their space for reflection and their ability to access support. So this, uh, it's the sum total of this is their space for action. And interventions therefore should endeavour to reverse this by seeking to enable expanding their space for action. As I said, this was one of the core concepts that, um, that was used in, in this, this study and in the study, um, uh, the researchers developed uh, a space for action scale, followed around 100 women, I think it was, at over four points in time, and they kind of retested, remeasured this space level of space for action, which covered eight different domains of women's lives at each point. Um, and we've used, uh, well, we've, yeah, we've used this um, uh, this concept or found that it has a utility um, in our recent work with perpetrators, um, it's kind of mirrored a change in, in some of the practice that we've seen in these projects. Um, and it's also um, informed our understanding conceptually so that we've come to in increasingly use the term space for action to describe not only work that uh, we want to see to, um, to, to see done in relation to survivors um, but that we want to see done in the opposite way in terms of reducing space for action um, in relation to perpetrators and the two are seen as inversely related um, and perhaps it's no coincidence that both of these projects that I'm about to talk about were implemented in partnership with um, and indeed led by women's organizations specializing in supporting survivors. So the first of these um, is a project called Prevent and Change uh, which we call PAC for short. Um, and this was a, a project that we evaluated a couple of years ago, uh, or beginning a few years ago, um, which tested a new approach to tackling prolific and high harm domestic violence perpetrators. And they were selected through something called the Dauntless Plus criteria, which uh, in a nutshell is um, men who, uh, or offenders who've committed multiple offences against multiple victims in different locations across boroughs. And this project took a, a multifaceted approach. Um, it, an element of it was regular interagency panels called PAC panels, and these were two hour monthly formal com conferences which were attended by statutory and non statutory partners um, with the goal of ultimate goal of increasing survivor safety, but their, their kind of um, objective was to improve the multi agency management of perpetrators. A second element of the work that they were seeking to do was to use um, data surveillance and disruption tactics to, do, to disrupt the, um, to reduce this, the offending of these perpetrators. Thirdly, they were seeking to engage these uh, individuals in behaviour change work. And finally, um, they were linked in with support services in each borough so that and um, survivors could be uh, referred to support if they were um, if they were in need of that and, uh, and willing to uh, take that up. So the, pan the panels were really interesting to observe. We actually went in and observed a number of them in, in the different boroughs. Um, terms of reference were that they were strictly to meant to focus on holding perpetrators accountable. Um, in the, in the most effective panels, the chair would reiterate this objective at the beginning of each panel and also remind panels of that, bringing them back to that where necessary. Um, it was notable that we did not witness many occasions where it was that needed to happen um, because the focus was um, regularly maintained on the actions of perpetrators without kind of veering into victim blame or responsibilising. Um, uh, and it was really interesting to see um, the process of sharing or pooling information in real time, sharing of intelligence effectively between all of these parties. A lot of them had their laptops in the room. They would look things up, um, check when they'd last seen the perpetrator or if they'd, when they last attended an appointment um, or whether there were other partners or children who had come to light that needed to um, be checked out to ensure that they were safe. 
Um, and, and one of the things that they did was to um, to pass on information about appointment times. So maybe there was a drug and alcohol service there um, who knew that the perpetrator was going to be turning up for an appointment on a given date. And so that they were able to inform police of that. Um, so some outstanding suspects were apprehended in that through that. Okay. Um, um, actions were created as a result of these panels um, and they uh, they were monitored. Uh, sent round to each um, individual responsible um, they were kind of revisited at the beginning of the, ne the next panel. Uh, letters were sent out by the police, um, warning letters to, to perpetrators saying that they were kind of noted as a, as a serial perpetrator. The surveillance side of it was, um, was less developed and I think unfortunately more, many more resources would have been necessary to, to really pursue that effectively. Um, but there were, it sort of focused more on the police side of things, the, the, the disruption that was conducted. The behaviour change work didn't receive quite as much take up as hoped for, but um, the, there was nevertheless overall a reduction in offending. Um, we looked at police data six months pre and post the project and over half of the whole sample, whether or not they engaged in um, the sort of group or one-to-one -one change work, um, showed a decrease in offending. And so that's suggested that some of these wider um, kind of perpetrator management um, techniques were having an effect. Um, the second project I wanted to talk about was uh, is called Change That Lasts, and that is um, a three-strand model that includes developing a, a pool of community ambassadors, uh, training staff in non-specialist services and ensuring that specialist services, support services are working in ways that recognise survival needs and strengths. And the idea is that these th three strands all work together to create a longer term, term change, hence the name change that lasts. Um, and this model was developed originally by Women's Aid England, drawing explicitly on the work that I mentioned earlier, finding the from finding the cost of freedom, um, that was conducted by Quazu. And it actually took the concept of space for action as foundational in developing a new model of intervention that placed survivors at the centre and experts about their own needs and situations. And we've been evaluating the Welsh version of that as implemented by Welsh Women's Aid, some adaptations that they've made. And first and foremost of those is that Welsh Women's Aid made a clear decision incorporate a, an explicit focus on perpetrators within their interpretation of this model. So alongside the three strands, um, there is a, there was a, a new early intervention project for perpetrators called CLEAR set up, which works with men at an early stage, who are at an early stage in recognising and addressing their abusive behaviour towards women. Um, it works exclusively with men and they're pro predominantly their female current or ex-partners. Um, and these are men who have not had extensive prior involvement with services before, and they take a number of self-referrals as well as referrals from other agencies. Um, and what's, so what's special about change at last in Wales in relation to space for action and uh, this reducing space for action with perpetrators is that it's not just that there's this local perpetrator intervention, but the clear service is an active expect to kind of sit behind it are an active partner with them. They co-deliver the training and they take their knowledge and about and their focus perpetrators into mainstream and specialist support services. For example, in the um, community ambassador strand called Ask Me, which involves ordinary lay community members um, starting conversations and providing information in a range of community settings and creating a kind of ripple effect through communities. Um, they are able to, uh, as well, of course, promote gr greater understanding and awareness about survivors, but the training that they undergo includes a, a, an extensive focus on perpetrators so that the myths and stereotypes or messages that are normalised violence against women and girls that they encounter can be challenged by these ambassadors because they're well equipped to do so. And similarly, while the trusted professional training aims to um, give uh, practitioners ways to provide a more informed and supportive response that will increase the survivor space for action. It's also about equipping them with the means to recognise the role of perpetrators in Borg and not colluding with them, um, no, knowing how to respond and where to refer them to um, in order to reduce their space for action to commit further violence. 
Again, um, the specialist services, while they're obviously seeking to provide earlier, sustained and more effective support to survivors, there's that link there there's between themselves and um, the partners, um, the men who are involved in the, in the CLEAR project, uh, whose partners oh, are referred sorry. to. <laughs> Very sorry, Joe, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, so okay, um, can you please conclude if possible? Well, yeah, can I just quickly skip through my reflections? I did have oh, a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, did have a couple of quotes, but I will pass over those and they're there for anyone to see if they want to refer to them. Um, so, yeah, just to, to sort of conclude, we've always had a recognition in our work that um, uh, although it's a, a, an important focus for us uh, to work on victim survivors in perpetrator work, um, there's been too much of a focus on survivors and not enough on, on, on perpetrators themselves and that responses really need to in, encompass that. Um, we've also always had a healthy scepticism, I would admit, about whether um, abusive men are willing to change and that's been challenged and informed to some degree in, in some of the work that we've done. Um, an ambivalence and a, indeed a reluctance in some specialist services about getting involved in um, perpetrator work but the, pro the projects that I've just cited, um, they kind of, they, the way they look at it is that it, um, they need to encourage professionals to understand that perpetrator work is also survivor work and that, that its ultimate goal is to make things safer for survivors. Um, and finally, um, space for action has been a really helpful concept, we think, in giving a terminology, a name for ways of working that women's organisations have historically carried out but haven't always been recognised and that funding and commissioning regimes have often squeezed with their emphasis on crisis-based time-limited work. Um, uh, and the extension of this concept to, to perpetrator work provides a way of focusing attention on perpetrators, um, a greater focus on them, um, and a way to articulate the ways in which they can be held account and challenged um, and their abusive um, behaviours potentially shut down in different ways by a variety of agencies. Um, yeah, sorry to run over. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Joe. This, this uh, presentation really uh, uh, addressed uh, many of the issues that were raised in previous, uh, in, in previous presentations and uh, uh, showed so, some interesting ways forward. So thanks a lot for this. Unfortunately, we <laughs> Uh, we don't have much time for questions, but, but we do have uh, time for, for two or three uh, questions if, if you'd like uh, to put them in, into the chat or, or just uh, maybe take the microphone um, if you want to raise them. So one, uh, one of the questions in the chat was about uh, social uh, constructions of masculinity and uh, how, how I think we'll manage to oper operationalize them. Uh, I'm not sure, Will, if you want to, to talk because uh, to answer because uh, your your research was qualitative, so it wasn't uh, particularly the, the concept of uh, operationalization was not particularly relevant but but maybe you want to say it. yeah it's it, it's an interesting question so I, I guess masculinity wasn't operationalized in the same way as it would have been if I was doing a a, a more uh, statistical or quantitative approach but but I do think it was still uh, involved some kind of um, employment of, of of some key ideas around masculinity and, and there were some other interesting comments in the chat as well about um you know policing that i think it debates and angie but i think all, all all four of us have made some reference to this a yeah, broader extension of uh the role of gender in the police service for example or in, or in other uh aspects of um the workplace or public life that um yeah, where these kind of masculine ideas are played out with consequences. So, so I, I guess I was drawing on, you know, um, th th there's quite a wealth of data, which is some of which has explored what how men behave without explicit reflection about it being about gender. So uh, Willis, who wrote about boys in school, 
uh, uh, Stanley, uh, uh, Albert Cohen, who wrote about you know groups of uh, delinquent boys in the U.S. You know, the uh, emphasis on physical toughness, uh, heterosexuality, and more explicitly, uh, Connell, you know, and Messerschmitt, who, who, who mentioned some key, key themes. So I, th I think I was using established ideas about masculinity and seeing, well, how, how, how to what extent can I see these going on in this environment? And I think that does have application to other avenues. So yeah, I was interested to see that comment as it appeared. Great, thanks very much. Yeah. So we have another question here uh, about, about preventative measures uh, such as training on gender socialization for teachers in the wider society. Um, I, I don't know, Will, if you if, if you can answer. Yeah, I, I guess other. But this is something which I think I, I think every facilitator I've spoken to who's involved in delivering work with perpetrators and actually the men themselves and so many of the men who'd attended groups raised that precise point there are so many men who said well i wish i'd been taught these kind of things in school i wish i'd been challenged by teachers who'd enabled me to think more carefully about relationships i wish i hadn't have just been stuck with what my parents had taught me and there is a real lack of input an exploration of what gender means in school and what masculinity means and relationship sort of training for want of a better phrase you know I, I think successive governments have modeled uh the education system in the uk uh on uh some countries in the far east which are very very uh rigorous and academically demanding and have reduced space for the sort of pastoral uh, personal development which is so important in enabling people to to manage relationships and themselves so so um it's a, a really pertinent issue, Raluca, uh, and one that requires research and more practice development. I don't know if other of my peers have got um, experience or knowledge of that. Uh, okay, it's, it's, it's th thanks a lot, Will. And now uh, I wonder, maybe uh, Angie, uh, perhaps, uh, or Joe could answer the question about uh, efforts to address DV perpetrators who are serving police officers and staff, if, if you, if you uh, know about this issue. Um, I, I don't have direct information about DV perpetrators uh, programs specifically for police officers and staff. I did actually speak to two victims of perpetrators that were police officers in the course of my research. Um, I will say that, that all of the layers of complexity to dealing with victims of domestic violence are amplified um, greatly when the perpetrator is a police officer. Um, I didn't eventually include those in my write-up of my research. One key thing is they are locked away in a cupboard. They're, they're locked away separately. They're not kept on the system like other cases of DV. Um, as you'd expect in most workplaces, I suppose, because there has to be some privacy for those um, that are being accused, but um, certainly not considered in the main pool of, of um, domestic violence cases, but certainly a, an issue that should be highlighted and considered more definitely, yeah. Excellent. Uh, th thanks, Angie. Uh, Sorry, I can't add a great deal to that. Um, uh, other than I, I totally agree what Angie's, with what Angie's just said. Um, it's not something that I've got specific um, data on, um, but I, I, I mean, I'm aware that um, of the sort of locality of the of that issue, and that um, that there are investigations ongoing at the moment, both in relation to DV and sexual violence um, that, that our police officers have been involved in. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, are there any more questions uh, which you would like to put in the chat or just ask? Will, did you want to ask us something? Yeah, I did, if I may. I mean, I was just thinking about one of the questions um, uh, that was, I think, posed perhaps to me about you know, operationalizing masculinity. And I just wanted to ask Angie, 
you know, knowing that she spent fairly substantial periods of time in, with the police, if actually the groups, the, 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 the dynamics that I was relaying with the group about the groups of met perpetrator uh, groups, you know, how men behaved, were there any similarities in what she observed among some serving police officers? Thank you, Will. Um, so yes, definitely so. Um, part of my research, I, I did some proactive stuff, some action stuff while I was there. I actually delivered some training for eight to nine months um, in a public protection training course. I was embedded for about two hours on a three day course, death by PowerPoint, they actually ended up calling it because um, it was over three days. They were forced to sit in a room. It was a pilot scheme. Um, focusing on various uh, different aspects of public protection, but DV being one of those slots. And in those sessions, yes, there was definitely displays of masculinity. I will make a point though, one of the biggest contests I got there against what I was delivering was from a female officer, um, a detective actually, so directly re responding to DV cases and some of the most serious ones. and she just blurted out in the middle of me talking, you can't come in here giving us this feminist stuff. Um, we have to respond to all victims and that includes men. Um, and, and the boys in the room, men in the room, um, then started to snigger and laugh. And I think that that somehow gave her some sense of validation. Um, despite me being angered by, by some of her attitude, um, I felt quite sorry for her actually, because I recognized her as a woman trying to exist in a, in a male dominated environment as well. Um, and clearly, I, I think that that, that behaviour was, was a bit of point scoring for her with the boys, if you like, that were in the room at the time. Um, so yeah, certainly some of those same kind of playing out of those issues, but with women involved as well as men. Okay, thanks a lot, Angie. Uh, it is sad, but this is, this is the reality, unfortunately. Um, can I so, just, just, Lana, can I just answer this just very quickly? There's a couple asking, so Mariela, um, she's currently mm -hmm. working with us at the moment, and also Rand is asking about accessing the sessions again. Um, if, if you want to contact me by email, I'm happy to share um, the slides, the content, and or talk to you a bit more. I know some of our students are involved in researching this at the moment as well. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to share the content and you can use it for your lectures, for your research, etc. That's no problem. Excellent. I think we have the last uh, question uh, for today uh, to Amy. Amy, how much of a role do you think this stereotyping of black women has in policing of cases involving them? I think Amy uh, addressed this, but maybe she would like to add something else. Yes, yeah, an important question. I think I think it has a huge role in this. And um, one of the things that's interesting about rape myths is there's a lot of overlap with racialized stereotypes as well. And there's um, a, a term that I think gets used a lot in discussions around violence involving women of colour and families of colour, this idea of culture. It's part of a culture and terms like honour get brought in, um, which is, is a way of othering and also almost avoiding that defensiveness again that Andy, Angie mentioned of oh it's it's something that, that's different to what we do so we're not going to get involved um, or we're not going to sort of rock the boat so I, I think that's a huge part of it um, and there's a, a, a lot of um, amazing literature out there on on the kind of the stereotyping of black women and yeah exactly as you said how it's feeds into how they're responded to how they're treated how their cases are taken seriously or not um, it's something we really need that intersection with rape myths and racial stereotypes. We need to understand on a more, a more mainstream level. I think. Thanks a lot, Amy. Uh, okay, uh, we, we have run out of time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, everybody, for making time to participate in this event, and of course to our presenters for such engaging and important presentations. I would also like to thank Anna and colleagues in the Research and Postgraduate Office for your support. And I do hope that you will join us again for the future events in our program. The next event uh, is on civic identity performance and the city on, on the 10th of March. Thanks a lot and ho hope to see you very soon. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.